हेलो स्टूडेंट्स वेलकम बैक टू द लेक्चर ऑफ दिस कोर्स द लास्ट थ्री लेक्चर्स आई वाज डिस्कसिंग अबाउट द प्रिंसिपल्स ऑफ एनएमआर स्पेक्ट्रोस्कोपी एंड आई स्टार्टेड डिस्कसिंग अबाउट हाउ टू गेट द स्ट्रक्चर ऑफ अ मॉलिक्यूल यूजिंग एनएमआर स्पेक्ट्रोस्कोपी आई विल कंटिन्यू विद दैट एंड देन आई विल अगेन गो टू 2D NMR spectroscopy, and I will let you know what is the potential of this particular molecule. Okay, so the first thing that we have to do is to find the potential of this particular molecule. Okay, so the first thing that we have to do is to find the potential of this particular molecule. Okay, so the first thing that we have to do is to find the potential of this particular molecule. Okay, so the first thing that we have to do is to find the potential of this particular molecule. Okay, so the first thing that we have to do is to find the potential of this particular molecule. Okay, so the first thing that we have to do is to find the potential of this particular molecule. Okay, so the first thing that we have to do is to find the potential of this particular molecule. Okay, so the first thing that we have to do is to find the potential of this particular molecule. Okay, so the first thing that we have to do is to find the potential of this particular molecule. Okay, so the first thing that we have to do is to find the potential of this particular molecule. Okay, so the first thing that we have to do is to find the potential of this particular molecule. Okay, so the first thing that we have to do is to find the potential of this particular molecule. Okay, so the first thing that we have to do is to find the potential of this particular molecule. Okay, so the first thing that we have to do is to find the potential of this particular molecule. Okay, so a compound structure those four features are number of signals position of signals intensity of signals and spin spin splitting of signals i will give you one example so let's look at 1d nmr of this compound ns2 cs2 cs2 n cs3 twice as you can see there are two proton attached to nitrogen two proton attached to uh, carbon two protons attached to this carbon and your six protons attached to these two carbons these six protons are equivalent because they have same environment these two protons are equivalent similarly these two protons are equivalent and these two protons are equivalent and so there is four different groups one consisting of this six proton another consisting of these two protons the third one consists of these two protons and fourth one consists of these two proton so there are four different kind of protons and so number of signals is going to be four that's what we expect in 1d nmr and this is your 1d nmr and you can see there are four different peaks four different peaks so let's go and understand how to assign this uh, the intensity of signals if you look at this is the ratio of intensity of signals and you can see the ratio is 1 is to 1 is to 3 3 is to 1 1 is to 1 is to 3 is to 1 and if you remember here there is two protons two protons here so total is 4 two protons here to 6 and then 3 here 3 here so 6 plus 6 12 protons 12 protons and intensity if you sum this this is equal to 2 plus 3 plus 1 is 6 so let's divide this by 2 so 12 divided by 6 is equal to 2 so one basically if you look at the equivalent hydrogens so we need to multiply this by 2 if i multiply this by 2 then i get the first group consist of two protons the second group consists of two protons the third group consists of six protons and fourth group consists of two protons the way we got is simply we multiply this by two so first thing is that when you get 1d nmr you look at the intensity and then you look at your compound and see how many protons are there now you sum all the intensity ratio and if suppose this comes to be 6 and there are 12 protons it means that uh you know each the intensity ratio corresponds to two protons corresponds to two protons so if intensity ratio is 1 that corresponds to two proton if intensity ratio is 3 then that corresponds to six protons so that's that's how we can uh 
get information from uh, intensity observed in case of proton NMR. And when you do that, it is quite easy to give the assignments. This has your intensity 3 means there should be 6 protons which are equivalent and if you look at the structure only these protons are these protons are equivalent and their number are 6. So, from the intensity itself you can assign this peak from intensity itself you can assign this peak. You can also look at the position of signal. So, for that you need to look at the electronegativity and if you look at the electronegativity then the this should come at a smaller chemical shift, this should come at your highest chemical shift because this is attached to electronegative atom. These protons are attached to NCH3 twice group which is less electronegative than NS2 group and so these protons will come at higher position, higher chemical shift position whereas these protons will come at lower chemical shift position. So, now you can also assign BC, BC here and D we have already assigned and this will be A based on the based on your uh, position or based on the chemical shift value. There are another thing which you can look at that is splitting. In this B and C you see these are two protons here which will couple with the two protons here. So, they will be split into three. So, both B and C protons are expected to split into three and here again this is CH3, CH3 and they are not coupled uh, to each other. Uh, they are not coupled to any uh, nearby proton and so you expect a single peak. So, you expect a single peak. So, this is the way you can assign the peaks of the 1D NMR, peaks of the 1D NMR. 13C carbon nuclei is also NMR active and so we can also look at 13C NMR and here you can see that there are three different kind of carbon. One is B, C and D, these are CH3, CH3 and so they are equivalent to each other since both has same environment. So, you expect three peaks and that is what you see here, there are three different peaks. 62.76, 45.68 and 39.68. Now, if we want to assign this, uh, these protons, if we want to know which of this carbon gives you this peak, we need to do uh, another experiment called depth experiment. Depth experiment can be of two type, depth 90 and depth 135. Depth uh, stands for distortionless enhancement by polarization transfer and uh, the, uh, it is a preferred method for determining number of protons attached to carbons. There are two different kind of depth, depth 90, depth 135. Uh, this 90, 135 is basically your proton pulse angle. A proton pulse angle is set at 90 degree, it is known as depth 90, whereas if proton pulse angle is set to be 135 degree, then it is known as depth 135. Uh, in depth 90, only CH shows, so you will not see any peak uh, due to CH2 or CH3, whereas in depth 135, CH3 CH2s are phased down whereas CH and CH3 are phased up. So, you will get positive signal and negative signal uh, depending on kind of carbon, kind of carbon. Okay? Here uh, when I say kind of carbon, I mean carbon is attached to how many protons, how many protons. 
So, this is example of depth 90 and depth 135 of this molecule and now you can see that if we look at the CH, I have only one CH group, only one CH group. So, I will get only one peak in depth 90, only one peak in depth 90, uh, but if I go to depth 135, then you look here, this is CH3, this is CH3 and this is CH3 and this is CH2 and this is CH2. So, you will get peak due to your all 3 CS, CS2, CS3, CS2 peak will be down. So, these 2 peaks are uh, due to CS2 and if you look at this CS2, there are 2 different kind of CS2, this is CS2 and this is CS2. So, you got 2 different peak for CS2, CH will come at higher chemical shift in comparison to CH3 and this is your CH peak, this is your CH peak and this is your CH3 peak. This is your CH3 peak and since uh, there are 3 different kind of CH3 and so you got 3 different CH3 peak, 3 different CH3 peak. CH is, there is one H here also. So, there is 2 CH group and so you are getting 2 peaks corresponding to CH and you have a 3 CH3 group and so you got 3 uh, peaks for CH3 and 2 peaks for CH2. Based on that you can assign different carbons. Now come back to the same compound which we are dealing with and uh, if I do depth 135, I will get peak of CH and CS3 up and CS2 down. So, you see there are 2 CS2 here belonging to these 2 CS2 where is CS3 this and this has only 1 peak. So, 45.68 is now assigned to CS3 group, now assigned to CS3 group. So, carbon, this carbon has chemical shift 45.68. This is the way you can assign proton, you can assign carbon. So, but still that may not be enough and for assignment and structure calculation you may need to use 2D and MR and they are very useful when protons are overlapping, when protons are overlapping. So, two protons having same chemical shift can be assigned if their correlation with nearby proton is different or nearby protons is different and then you can look at the proton-proton correlation to proton-proton correlation to uh, distinguish between two different protons. Uh, two protons with same chemical shift can be assigned if their correlation with carbon to which they are attached is different and in that you can look at your heteroatom correlation means carbon and proton correlation. So, the two different kind of 2D NMR uh, experiment you can think of one which correlates proton with proton and another which correlates proton with carbon or proton with nitrogen. So, uh, 1D NMR we have already seen in 2D NMR there will be two dimension, one dimension can be proton, the other dimension can be proton or carbon if you are particularly doing with organic compound then people uh, try to look at the correlation between proton and carbon. Uh, there are some time if you go to more complex molecule for example, your uh, proteins in that case people also look at 3D NMR and uh, 4D NMR. So, basically you are trying to differentiate between different proton based on their correlation with heteroatoms and 
other protons in the system. So, most common 2D NMR experiments are COSI where proton and proton are correlated and then uh, there is experiment called head core in which carbon and proton is correlated. HMQC is better version of head core and again this is related to CH correlation. HSQC, CH correlation, HMBC, here the carbon and hydrogen are correlated which are separate by two to three bonds. Then the next 2D experiment is NOGI. NOGI looks at the nearby proximity of two protons, nearby proximity of two protons. So, 2D NMR spectroscopy is important because it gives you an idea about who is talking to whom. Uh, the first simplest one is proton proton koji. Mm, it tells you how and which protons are coupled to one another. It is very useful when peaks are overlapping in proton NMR and you are unable to calculate coupling constant or when there are a lot of similar coupling constant. There will be two different kind of peaks in 2D NMR. One is your diagonal peak and another is cross peaks. What you are looking at is cross peaks. Cross peaks are coupled to each other. When there is coupling, then we will see a cross peak. And one of the important variation of this uh, this spectroscopy method is DQF Koji, which is double quantum filter Koji. Same information, but it is more cleaner. Let us look at this molecule. Now you can see there is a correlation between your this proton and this proton and that is what you can see. Now as I told in COSI there is a diagonal peak and there are cross peaks. Diagonal peaks are not that much useful. What is useful is cross peaks because that tells you about that this proton is talking to which proton, which next proton. So, here is the four, uh, five cross peaks uh, because there are five different atoms. So, this is one, this is the second and this is the third and then your uh, gamma fourth one. Now, you look at their correlation. So, now you see NH is basically if you look at this NH is correlated to H alpha and that is how you can assign it. Now, H alpha is correlated to H beta. So, you can see there is a cross peak here, there is cross peak here and they are correlated to two different resonances and the way we can get it is draw a vertical line, draw a horizontal line and it coincides with this peak and this peak. It means these two peaks are correlated. So, H alpha and H beta protons are correlated and then H beta is correlated to two gamma, two different gamma and that is your CH3, CH3 groups. So, correlation between different protons can be seen through COSI. Then comes the DQF which is double quantum, double quantum filtered Koji. Now, let us understand about what we mean by double quantum or multiple quantum filters. So, if there are two spins, they can be in alpha alpha state, beta alpha state, alpha alpha, alpha beta state and beta beta state. Alpha means you are talking about up spin, beta means you are talking about down spin. So, if both are up, then you have a alpha alpha and if both are both are down then this is beta beta. If I spin is down and S spin is uh, up then you have beta alpha. When I spin is up and S spin in down then you have alpha beta. 
And now if you go from alpha alpha to alpha beta, this your this transition corresponds to change in spin to delta s is equal to 1. So, it is basically you are going from so this is half and here is half here half and this is minus half. So, you are going from half to minus half. So, delta s is minus half minus half. So, delta s is minus 1 and uh, if delta s is minus 1 or plus 1 then basically you have a single quantum single quantum uh, transition. So, if total spin change is 1 then you have single quantum transition and that you can see with this one, this one, this transition and this transition. So, a 1, a 2, x 1, x 2 the total spin change is 1. If you look at the d q, d q is basically this one and here you see you are going from alpha alpha to uh, beta beta and here the total spin change is 2 and that is that transition is called double quantum transition. If you go from uh, beta alpha to alpha beta or alpha beta to beta alpha the spin change is 0 and that kind of transition is known as zero quantum transition, zero quantum transition. So, if we look at normal cosy it will look like this, but if you go to double quantum filter cosy it will look like this. So, these two are positive peaks and these two are your negative peaks, these two are negative peaks and they give much cleaner spectra and so now where it is your DQF Koji is carried out. So, this is Koji which shows the correlation between protons that are coupled to each other. Uh, then HSQC as we discussed uh, before that it shows correlation between carbon and protons that are bonded directly to one another. So, this side is your carbon chemical shift whereas, this side is proton chemical shift and you are looking at the correlation. So, this side is you see this is your proton NMR spectrum and this side is your carbon NMR spectrum. Now, again come back to this uh, compound which we were discussing this has already been assigned and that is what we did uh, previously. So, this is your proton NMR and this has been assigned to if you take a b c d different kind of protons and this is your assigned a spectrum 1 d spectrum. Then if you go and take cosy you will get this kind of cosy this is d q f cosy and now you can see the correlation. So, if you look at this cross peak and put a horizontal lines and vertical lines. So, now you know that this one is correlated to these two peaks are correlated, these two peaks are correlated, this belongs to C, this belongs to B. So, B and C are uh, B and C are correlated and that is expected because this B and this C are nearby to each other and so their protons are coupled and so you can get the corresponding peaks in Koji. So, Koji gives you an idea about the protons which are near to each other, protons which are near to each other. And here you see D is not, D is only you are correlated to D there is no cross peaks and so there is no protons which are coupled to the protons labeled by D. Now, let us look at its correlation, its correlation. So, you can see that there are three different kind of carbon. So, you got three different peak and now you can correlate this carbon is basically correlated with this carbon is 
basically attached to this proton. This carbon is attached to this proton and this carbon is attached to this proton. So, so now you can this is for D. So, carbon chemical shift carbon chemical shift for this proton D, uh, D carbon D carbon carbon chemical shift of D carbon is 45 ppm and carbon chemical shift for C carbon is your around 62.5 whereas carbon chemical shift of B carbon is 40 ppm. So, this is the way you can assign all the peaks this is the way you can assign all the peaks. Now, you can also carry out HMVC and this is particularly useful if uh, your compound is quite big. It shows correlation between protons and carbon that are 2 to 3 bonds apart, 2 to 3 bonds apart. So, this side again there is a proton NMR spectrum and the y axis is your carbon NMR spectrum. Now, look at here correlation. Now, you see this is your HMBC for this compound, your B, C, D. Now, you can see that B is correlated to, if you look at 1, 2. So, here you see this C is correlated to B, since it is one bond apart. And then you can see that I look at this, this B is correlated to C. and C is correlated to D, C is correlated to D and now you see here this D is correlated to not only C, it is also correlated to your D. So, this D is correlated, okay, this is D, D is correlated to C and D is correlated to this one also. And now B is correlated to D, B is also correlated to D and you see this is one bond, two bond, three bond apart, three bond apart. Now, what I will do that I will give you one structure and we will discuss about how to get how to get uh, all the resonance and structure from the NMR spectrum. So, this is a compound which has molecular formula C10H18O and this is the your structure of this compound which is ipsenol. ipsenol. Now, let us see how we can assign it. So, first thing we need to know how many aliphatic carbons. So, it has two methyl group here right and this is C S 2 group and this is C S 2 group. There is a C H group and this is C S 2 group right and there is H here. So, it has two methyl group one C H the C C H this one is C H. 2 C S 2, this C S 2, this C S 2 group, this is aliphatic carbon. Oh, so, this is 1 C H group, sorry, this is 1 C H group, this is not aliphatic. Uh, then 1 C H O group, so this is C H O, so O H group, so this is 1 group, 2 double bond C S 2 group, so C S 2, C S 2 and 1 double bond C H, 1 double bond C H and 1 double bond C. So, 1 double bond C. So, these are all the, this is 1 double bond C which is not attached to any proton. So, this is the way this structure is. Uh, so, if you count uh, hydrogen atom, you have 3 here, okay, 3 3, 6 or oh, there is one proton here also 
one proton here also. So, this is your 3, 4, 3, 7, 2, 9, 10, 2, 12, 14, 15 and 2, 17 and 1, 18. 18. So, there, there is 18 hydrogen 18 hydrogen, but proton attached to carbon is 17. If you neglect this, then proton attached to carbon is 17. In all 17 hydrogen, 2 is as a methyl group, 1 is CH. So, so this is not CH, this one is CH, 2 CH2, this 2, and these 2 are CH2 group, 1 CHO, so this is 1 CHO, this is 1 CHO and 4 olefanic carbons, 2 CH2 and 1 double bond CH, 1 double bond CH and 1 double bond C. So, this is thing. So, here we have looked at how many protons which are attached to carbon. The one missing might be attached to heteroatom and so this is your heteroatom OH and that is how you can count about uh, 18H. Now, look at its proton spectrum. This is your proton spectrum of this compound. Now, if you go by intensity ratio, this will correspond to 1H, this will correspond to 4H and since they are in at higher chemical shift, so they can be assigned as olefinic 1 CH double bond, 2 CH 2 double bond. So, this can be assigned and from this you can again see that this 4 has same environment and this 1 has a different environment and so this can be assigned to CS2 double bond and this will be assigned to CS double. Okay. So, again by intensity ratio you can assign this to 1H and this uh, chemical shift region is your H attached to CO group, H attached to CO group and then you have the intensity ratio is here quite high, it is like 6 H. So, it means you have 2 methyl triplet here. So, this can be assigned now and there are 6 H which will come from 1 from CH, 2, uh, 2 into 2, 4 from CH2 and 1 from OH. Now, it is a bit difficult to assign here. So, what we will do that we will do go for a 2D experiments. So, these are aliphatic region. So, let us go and look at the koji, koji of this uh, structure. Now, these are pigs which are which are on diagonal and now I know that this is for CS3, CS3. So, let us see the things which we have already assigned. This is uh, for methyl, this is CHO double bond, CS2 double bond CH. Now, let us see if I relate this this is related to this peak, okay. this is related to this peak which is due to methyl group is related to this one and so this O, this, this red circle corresponds to this CH group which is attached to 2 methyl group. So, now I am able to assign this peak. Now, let us go and look at. So, this now this one this uh, red circle is now correlated to this this peaks and that corresponds to this triangle this triangle and if you go and look at the structure basically this CH is attached to this CS2 and now we know that this CS2 basically corresponds to this triangle. So, now this CS2 is also assigned 
this C S 2 is also assigned. Now, you see this is correlated to these two peaks is also correlated to C H O. So, so that is what is correlated and so it is now quite easy to uh, assign peaks, assign peaks which was difficult to assign by 1 D NMR. So, till now we have already assigned, now look at this and see that this H is coupled to which proton, which coupled to which proton. So, you see this is coupled to two, two different kind of proton, this proton we have already seen that there is a coupling with between these two protons, but there is also coupling with this two peaks and that correspond to these two peaks. So, if you look at this, so this is basically coupled to this C S 2 group, C S 2 group. So, now the chemical shift of this is also assigned or these protons are also assigned, these protons are also assigned. Now, let us go where these two protons are correlated, these two protons are correlated to this and this is a very weak peak. So, if you go and see the structure, this is also related to double bond C S 2 and so you can see this C S 2 is correlated to double bond C S 2, this C H O is correlated to your this double bond C S 2 and this is a weak peak because it is two bond apart. This C S 2 and this C S 2 uh, are two bond apart and so a very weak peak will be uh, seen and if you remember this structure also has this thing. So, this C S 2 is also correlated to this C H and the way you can see is this you remember this C S 2. So, they are also attached to this weaker peak, this weaker peak and that corresponds to your this C H, okay, this corresponds to this C S 2. So, this is also correlated to this by this one and if you go here, the C S 2 which is here and this C S 2 is correlated to, this C S 2 is also correlated to this C H. So, this C H is correlated to C S 2 and so this C H uh, protons are shown here, this C H protons are shown here. So, there is a correlation between C S 2 which is this C S 2 and this C H and that can be seen here, that can be seen from here. And this is how we correlate, uh, correlate different protons and we assign all the peaks, we assign all the peaks. So, 2D NMR is used for more complex organic molecules since a uh, lot of chemical shifts are overlapping particularly in the aliphatic region. Uh, it is difficult to assign uh, the protons which comes from which comes from uh, which are attached to similar kind of carbon, similar kind of carbon and in that case based on proton they cannot be assigned and so it is better to go for Koji kind of a spectrum, Koji kind of a spectrum. So, here I show you some more Koji spectrum of some more molecules. So, here is your molecule C double bond C. Uh, C O H and this is H and here is C L and uh, the second carbon is attached with H and C L. So, in Koji you will look at the correlation between H A and H X and you can see here that here is the correlation between H A and H X. So, you will see two uh, peaks which are cross peaks two peaks which are cross peaks, one 
uh, both showing the correlation between H A and H X. Now, if you look at this uh, compound which is ortho, ortho uh, nitro aniline, ortho nitro aniline. In this case, uh, there are four different kind of proton which is attached to carbon and there is one more which is attached to your NS2 group, NS2 group. And uh, if you look at here, then your HA, HC, HB, HB, HD, HB and NS2. So, the lowest one is NS2 and since others are attached to uh, carbon, double bond carbon, so they have higher chemical shift value, higher chemical shift value. HA has highest chemical shift value because it is nearby to an electro electron withdrawing group, electron withdrawing group uh, and that affects HA and HC more because they are an ortho and para position and so you get HA, HC. Now you can look at the correlation. HA is correlated to HB, HA is correlated to HB. Now, SC is correlated to HC, if you look at SC, it is correlated to these two peaks and that is your HB and HD, HB and SD, HB and SD. So, HC is correlated to HB and SD. Now you see this HD is correlated to HD is correlated to HC, HD is correlated to HC and this AB, HB is correlated to SC and HA, HC and HC, HB is correlated to HB is correlated to HA, HC. So based on that if you have a confusion there is a bit confusion between HD and HB and so you can assign the HB and SD peaks looking at the Koji spectrum, Koji spectrum. Now we will look at the head core, this side is your proton spectrum, so your y axis is proton and x axis is your carbon, carbon spectrum. Now we can also assign the carbon, we can also assign the carbon. So we know that this corresponds to CH, so carbon of this proton can be assigned and that corresponds to around 138 ppm. Now this CH2, here you see this side is your, so now you can assign this protons also and they have your carbon chemical shift around these values. Now CHO, you see this well around this carbon is going to have chemical shift, carbon chemical shift around your 75 ppm, 75 ppm, 75 ppm. These two protons is correlated to this carbon which comes at 40 ppm and again this proton comes uh, is correlated to these carbons, correlated to this carbon which comes around 30 ppm, which comes around 30 ppm and then these two protons are correlated to this carbon which comes around or 48 or 50 ppm and this methyl protons is correlated to carbon which, uh, which is at 20 ppm, 20 ppm. So we have seen how COSI is used to assign the different protons 
and now we have seen how head core can be used to assign your carbon attached to those particular protons, those particular protons. Similarly, in place of a head core, you can use uh, your HMQC or HSQC to look at the correlation between carbon and proton, carbon and proton and this is the way you can assign the different uh, NMR signals, different NMR signal. NMR can also be used as to see the structure of biomolecule, for example, proteins. They are basically fingerprints of the structure of the molecule. Here we show you the HSQC where 15N has been correlated with proton uh, for a protein, for a protein. And you can see that there are several peaks, there are several peaks and that basically corresponds to your amide nitrogen, amide nitrogen and proton uh, correlation, correlation. So first thing is how to assign it. The assignment is done using your 3D experiments, for example, HNCA, where the correlation between correlation between a proton attached to nitrogen uh, and C alpha is seen. Basically here you are looking at the correlation between proton attached to nitrogen, nitrogen and C alpha. So here what has been done is your there is on x axis there is proton and y axis there is carbon and on z axis you are taking nitrogen and that's why it is known as 3D NMR method, 3D NMR method. And for one value of N, basically one value of nitrogen chemical shift, you can look at uh, how proton and carbon is correlated. So proton will be correlated with 13 C alpha of ith amino acid and 13 C alpha of I minus 1 amino acids. So proton is correlated to C alpha of ith amino acid and your C alpha of I minus 1 amino acid. Now what you do is uh, you try to correlated each of this 15N plane with other planes and try to find out where there is your correlation and so you can find out, uh, you can assign the backbone resonances. Now the way you do is, is now you take all the planes, all the different planes uh, which differ in 15N chemical shift and now try to look at that which plane coincides with the plane coincides with the plane where C alpha of preceding residues is correlated with C alpha C alpha of the uh, residue of ith residue. Now look at here, this big circle is given for, this big circle is given for uh, ith, the correlation between proton and C alpha of the same species, whereas this smaller circle is given for correlation between uh, proton, uh, amide proton of ith residue and C alpha of preceding residue, C alpha of preceding residue. So if you look at here, this is two peaks and what does this tells you? This is your for ith residue and this is for I minus 1 residue. The 
smaller circle is matched, a smaller circle of ith residue is matched with a bigger circle of i minus 1 residue, i minus 1 residue and that is how you see this one is matched to bigger, a smaller is matched to bigger, a smaller is matched to bigger and this is the way you know how you can assign the backbone, how you can assign the backbone. Similarly, you can do for HNCO experiment and once you assign all the peaks in HSQC, now you can go and uh, determine just based on chemical shift what will be the secondary structure, what will be the secondary structure and that is done by comparing 13 C alpha chemical shift and 13 C beta chemical shift of uh, the given protein and uh, their deviation from the uh, chemical shift of the amino acid when they are in random coil. Random coil and uh, your 13 C alpha, 13 C beta chemical shift uh, based on chemical shift also you can assign which amino acid it may belong to and that is going to help you when you are assigning uh, the peaks based on HNCA or HNCU experiments and these are the few facts which has been seen that chemical shift of 13 C beta varies between 15 to 24 for alanine, this C beta peak will be absent for uh, in the glycine, serine it varies from 58 to 67 and these are the few things which you can use during the assignment during the assignment. Now once you have assigned all the peaks corresponding to your protons in a protein, you go for NOE and NOE gives you distance between two protons, distance between two protons and as you, as uh, distance are used to for construction of a house, similarly here distance constraint uh, is used to fold the protein using your computational software, using computational software. So in the first you generate a simple random coil consisting of all the, uh, all the amino acids and then you put constraint, distance constraint and dihedral constraint and that is used to fold the protein, that is used to fold the protein and that is how NMR structure of a protein is generated. The different NOE distance restraint can be 3D 15N edited nosy, 3D uh, 13C edited nosy, 4D 13C 13C edited nosy, 3D 15N 13C edited nosy and 3D 15N 15N edited nosy. Uh, we can also use the dihedral information obtained from 3 bond H, N, H, uh, H alpha coupling constant. I have already told you uh, about the car plus equation which is this and that can be used to get uh, this dihedral angle theta and that can also be used as a constraint when you are solving NMR structure. The third uh, constraint comes from residual di uh, polar coupling measurement uh, where dipolar coupling is basically dependent on theta and theta where theta is the angle of uh, NH vector with the external magnetic field and these angles can be used uh, for the can be used for the uh, your uh, structure calculation can be used for the structure calculation and the way we measure dipolar coupling is to uh, put it inside a bicells, bicell uh, where now the protein will be partially in that case prote a protein will be partially aligned with the magnetic field and that is how you can get the information about theta. This is the same how dipolar uh, coupling can be related to 
the different angles and uh, using those angle information uh, we can basically get more accurate NMR structure. So, this is the way in which dipolar coupling measurement is done. This is your decoupled spectra. If we uh, if we take coupled, so you can get in phase and anti phase. Uh, this is your J value, and uh, if the uh, you know you take coupled spectra in alignment medium, the your difference will be equal to j plus d difference will be equal to j plus d so once you take the spectra in absence of alignment medium you get the value of j in the alignment media you get the value of j plus d so you can know what is the dipolar coupling value what is the dipolar coupling value and that's how you can get another constant which can be used to get a much better quality structure. The second thing which you can do using HSQC is that you can also get the information about interaction. So, here there is overlay of HSQC of cytochrome C with or without cytochrome B5, cytochrome B5. So, what you are trying to look at is how cytochrome C interacts with cytochrome B5 and uh, the, there is an overlap of HSQC peak and you can see that a uh, lot of peaks are quite overlapping with each other, you see here quite overlapping with each other, uh, uh, but there are certain peaks which is moving for example, uh, T89, L68, G77, G77 and uh, this information, this information where peaks are moving uh, can give you an idea at which part of cytochrome C is interacting with cytochrome B5, cytochrome B5. So, using that uh, chemical shift uh, deviation, you can measure the binding constant, you can measure the binding constant uh, and uh, uh, you can measure the binding constant and this is your one of the typical peak which we used to get the binding constant of cytochrome C with cytochrome B5. So, once you know that that this molecules this uh, this interface is involved in binding with the another protein then you can just put that into software. Here Haddock has been used, Haddock is a software which utilizes that in, uh, information about the interface to do the docking and if you incorporate those information, you will get a much better complex structure. So, NMR can also be used to look at the binding site or getting a complex structure. So, thank you very much uh, and uh, I hope that I have given a flavor of how to use NMR in structure calculation of structure calculation of protein and uh, organic molecule. Uh, the scope of NMR is quite vast it is difficult uh, to talk about every aspect in just four lectures, but I, I hope that this is good enough background uh, for you to go and look at NMR quite uh, closely. So, thank you very much.